Amy Marie Forstrom, Accessibility API 101. Um, hi, so I'm Amy Murray. I'm not really good at intros either. Um, <laughs> I've been um, working in tech for the last two decades. Um, I've started in networking, moved across into web. Um, I use assistive technologies as a screen reader, more so from an audio perspective, uh, auditory perspective, so I use it extremely slow <laughs> compared to somebody who's using it from a vision perspective. Um, and I guess the area that I kind of specialise in, just to give you a little bit of that background, is um, autism spectrum, ADHD, dyslexia and other cognitive um, issues. And I have done my research in educational psychology, uh, human cognition and user interface design. Um, so hopefully today what I want to do is impart a little bit of knowledge across as to how the accessibility API works. Um, if I could get a real quick of show of hands, just so I know how many people are aware of the Accessibility API in the browser? <laughs> All right, cool. So hopefully it won't bore you then. <laughs> um, and hopefully it will impart a little something extra that you mightn't know. Um, feel free to raise your hand if you want to call out something or correct something or anything like that. So I guess it kind of all starts somewhere back in the 90s. Um, and that's kind of, I guess, a pretty magical um, period. And I still think it's one of the most important applications that we've ever designed, which is the browser. Um, so the browser came along in the 90s, and with that came the document object model. And I still love actually calling it the document object model because it was intended for that, because what it actually was intended to do was to turn a web page into a document format. So if we think of the same way that Word document works, that's the way the document object model was supposed to work, with headings, um, footers, etc. So it's our little look there of the original. <laughs> Uh, document object model. So shortly after that, uh, DOM came along, the Accessibility API was born. And it's arg arguably one of the most um, kind of, I guess, important advances that we made in the web was actually the Accessibility API. So with that kind of gave us the achievement of not just screen readers, um, but all assistive technologies out there as well. So you sip and puff and various other things. Um, just a little quick view there. Um, just for everybody in the room, sorry, that was I've just showed on the screen a view of Microsoft Explorer's accessibility tree. So where are we now? Well, ever since the late 90s, we've had operating system and browser accessibility API. There is a direct mapping between operating system level API and the browser API, and you can find this documentation on W3C. And what this means is that kind of it hopes to give you a seamless experience when going between using your operating system controls and using your browser controls. Let's have a little look at the stack. So we've got at the bottom the operating system, then we've got on top of that the browser, and I've got at the next layer the OS um, accessibility API and the DOM accessibility API because there is a direct mapping there, so realistically they're at that same level, and then above that is the assistive technology because they speak directly to assistive technology and not to the UI. So with accessibility API, a lot of work is actually done in the browser for you. And a lot of this comes from the fact of the document object model already having a lot of those good parts in it. So we're going to have a little bit of a deep dive into that. Um, Semi-high level, but a bit deep. So how does it all work? So we've got a user using assistive technology. So let's just say a screen reader for this case. Um, the user tabs to the form submit. This sends a message across, the DOM sends a message across to the browser, Ali API. This then packages it down into tokens, which sends it across to the assistive technology. So in this case, it was a screen reader, which then reads out to the user that it's a submit button, it's focus, it has focus, and it's clickable. So really what we're doing is taking scripts to tokens to information. So what happens is we get all our files, our JavaScript library, CSS, image files. 
These are processed by the browser and interpreted by the DOM and then built, builds the accessibility tree, which we'll take a little look at. So how does this look? Well, if we're looking at the screen at the moment, I've got a code there for an image. So in this piece of code here, so we've got image, the source equals Australian flag, underscore flag dot JPEG, and the alt tag is Australian Indigenous flag. Um, so from the DOM, what the DOM sees to this, the DOM will take painted into that visual in the UI, the actual Australian flag dot JPEG, so that will take that image and paint that into the UI. And for the accessibility API, what it will read out to the assistive technology is what we've declared there. So it knows that the role is an image because we've used the image element, and it also knows that the name is Australian Indigenous flag because that's what they've told it. And we see the separation there occur um, because the accessibility API, the key thing there is it only talks to assistive technologies. It is not for the browser and the UI. So that is why we have on that diagram that I've showed on there, there is a split happening to show what's going to the UI and what's going into the assistive technology. So this all really works um, because it has a common language. And the common language that we have is HTML elements are explicit. So here we've got, so here I've got a phone device there, and then we've got a search bar with a search button. So what happens here is the accessibility API knows. So we've used an input field for the search and we've used a search button. So the search button, the accessibility API knows because we've used a button that its role is a button. It knows that its name is search because we've told it. At the moment it has a value of none. By default its state is focusable. We've given it a description of search this site and we've given it an aria live of polite. And this is how, so that's the information that the accessibility API will take in and then be able to process for assistive technologies. So a little bit of a look at it there and what I've got on the screen at the moment is a HTML document. So it's just showing the HTML, a header and a body. It's asking how old you are in the title. It's got a label for age and an input for your age number and a value of 42 and then a button for back and a button next. So here we can see underneath it roughly what the accessibility API sees. So it knows that ID equals one, its role is web area, the name is how old are you. ID two is a role label, its name is age. ID three is a role text field, it's labelled by IDs two and its value is 42. So you can start to see how it's not, um, it's really not a large amount of information. In fact, we'll see in a bit that the, access, uh, the DOM is quite a larger document than the Accessibility API. And then, so really, as we said, role. So I don't need, I think I don't need to go over this too much in this room. The key things that the Accessibility API is really looking for is role. So it declares, and in that role, it's kind of explicitly de declaring that this is a button, this is the behaviours it's going to have. So if we've got a... <laughs> A link, anchor tag, that it knows that it's going to be something that we want to click on, so it will be keyboard focusable, and there will also be a mouse action there as well. Names are very important. Names can come from a lot of things, so we can define names for elements. Um, we have alt tags, for example, for images, and the example I've got on the screen there is the check checkbox and then a label for that checkbox, which is then used as the name for that element. The state, uh, good old state, the thing that we have <laughs> probably most, um, most of our trouble with, I think, in accessibility, is controlling the state, and especially with modern, modern DOMs. And I guess it's magic. And what I mean by that is by using native HTML elements, the accessibility API already knows what's going on. Um, and this is what I mean by let the browser do the work. So you'll hear a lot of people, a lot of accessibility engineers and that talking about let the browser do the work for you. And what we mean by that is by using native elements, straight up that accessibility API already knows. It knows that you want to focus on it, that you're going to keyboard click on it, and various other things. Um, and I guess another thing to mention there as well is the reason that this is important to talk about is because, as we've said, um, we've got span and divs, and span and divs are actually ignored. And we'll see what I mean. So here on the screen what I've got is accessibility API, 
um, and the DOM. So realistically, what the Accessibility API is, is a subset of the DOM. But the difference is, is it's had information removed. So it's not adding extra information there, it's actually removing information. And the reason that it's doing that is to be quite a bit leaner as well. And because not all that information is needed by assistive technology, so hence it's dropped. And in this, in the next slide, I guess what I'm, what I'm saying there is, um, and it, we've got in our DOM structure, so we can see we've got a H1 tag, a span, a H2, a button, and an input. In the accessibility API, the H1 and H2 button and input come across, but the span doesn't. And the reason, I guess, <laughs> to speak about this one a little bit more, why is this important? Because we see a lot of problems these days where JavaScript frameworks use divs to create a lot of elements. So in this scenario, if I had a div, if I was using a, a span or a div, let's say a div for the button, um, for another button, then that actually won't come across into the accessibility API as a button unless I actually state this is a button, this is its role, this is its name, and try and force that into the accessibility API. But by nature, the button comes into there with all information. So how does it all work? Well, as we said before, so the HTML CSS gets taken up into the DOM, the DOM document object model is created, and it's basically, as we know, it's a high presenting hierarchy of nodes and objects of that document. The DOM then creates a subset of itself into the accessibility API. So that is how that accessibility API, the accessibility tree, I should say, is created. So how does JavaScript fit into all this? Or does it? Um, so as we said, HTML is, <laughs> the DOM is built from, from HTML and CSS. And it builds across to the accessibility API. So in the, um, in the model that I'm showing on screen, I've got the HTML feeding into the DOM. I've got the DOM feeding into the accessibility API. And you see underneath it, I've got JavaScript feeding into the DOM. There is no connection between JavaScript and the accessibility API. And this is why the myth was created that JavaScript um, isn't accessible. JavaScript is accessible. It's just that JavaScript itself can't talk direct to the accessibility API. And this is where ARIA comes along. So what happened was, I like to kind of talk about it as the internet is one of these, I don't know if you've ever been to Seattle and the current Seattle is built on top of the old Seattle, not the what was it Seattle before the people made Seattle, but literally the original Seattle city because it was underwater level. So they had to build on top of it to raise up the city so the toilets would work because they needed to flush them with pressure. Um, the internet's a little bit like that. We built the internet at the beginning and we built it to work with HTML. We got this wonderful thing called the Accessibility API and everything was great and working for a while. And then we started building new layers on top of the web. And with that, we had greater interaction in JavaScript. And this is why ARIA was born. ARIA talks directly to the Accessibility API. It is the only thing that talks directly to the Accessibility API. So we see in this model, we've got HTML feeding into the DOM, feeding into the Accessibility API. And then under the DOM, we've got JavaScript feeding into it. And under the Accessibility API, we have ARIA. There is no way to use JavaScript to talk to that Accessibility API. But we manipulate it all the time, right? So how do we do that? Well, the key thing there is to say that what we're doing with that, this is where ARIA comes in. So the only way that we can manipulate that accessibility API is then by either using ARIA on our HTML, ARIA tags on our HTML or injecting the ARIA tags through the JavaScript. So in a sense, you know, people go, but we use JavaScript to do accessibility. We do. But as you can see, we're not directly speaking to that API. And this is the problem that we're getting to when we start looking at shadow DOMs, shady DOMs, grandfather DOMs, grandmother DOMs. I've lost how many DOMs we're in the middle of at the moment. But you can see this is where the problem starts to come. Because JavaScript's constantly modifying that DOM. But the accessibility API is not being constantly modified. And that's where the disconnection happens. There is work with the W3C and the T59 JavaScript group, 
to actually do some work in that area. I haven't followed it for the last year and a bit, so I can't give you the latest update on it, but I'm pretty sure we're still at very early phases last time I checked. It's not an easy task. Um, so how does all the pieces of the puzzle come together? So what we've got on the left-hand side, we've got ARIA tags, JavaScript, CSS and HTML. And this is feeding into the DOM. The DOM feeds into the Accessibility API. And what we can see from this is the DOM talks directly to the browser to paint the UI. But the Accessibility API does not talk to the browser. It talks to assistive technologies. And this is the reason why when you're testing, um, you do need to use a tool like a screen reader, et cetera, to actually test this. Now, um, another thing to discuss about ARIA is ARIA is only for screen readers. And I, this is something that most people don't actually uh, know, I think, a lot, that, that are coming in new to accessibility. Sorry for all the, of us that are a bit older in the room. Um, and I don't mean age, I mean as in time <laughs> spent doing accessibility. Um, but so this is, yeah, this is kind of, I guess, the really big thing as well. So if you've got a sip and puff, if you've got other um, assistive technologies, they are going to be relying on HTML elements. They're not going to be interpreting your ARIA tags. So what does it all mean? Well, it kind of all means really that we should really be focusing on native elements. And by doing native elements, we let the browser and the accessibility API do so much work for us. There is so much that we don't have to be adding on to that if we're using these uh, elements. If we're not and we're creating our own components or we're trying to make a component accessible, uh, then we really need to be declaring the role, the name and the state. And we do this then via ARIA tags. But as I've said, it won't come across to everything. So where does this leave us then? A um, little bit of quick takeaways. So hopefully I've imparted some new stuff. So accessibility mechanics, I like to break it into three phases. Um, not just my industry breaks into three phases, but that's why I kind of call it the three phases, which is the user agent, which is where our browser DOM access lives, um, and our JavaScript, the accessibility API, and then the assistive technology that the accessibility, um, accessibility API speaks to. Passing through the stack, so as we can see, we've got, H, as we said before, HTML, CSS, JavaScript passes across into DOM. The DOM then generates the Accessibility API. Accessibility API only talks to assistive technologies, and the DOM then creates and paints the UI in the browser. So a little bit of me accessibility mechanics takeaways. Native HTML elements first. If the browser's going to do the work for you, why not? Let it do it. Um, always test your site with keyboard access. It's not the easiest thing to people, for people to test or use a, a screen reader. Um, I understand that. Um, so you can actually just test with keyboard access as well. Um, if that's, you know, if that's kind of don't have the time or whatever, not for screen reader, keyboard testing is really good. Um, providing accessible names is, should be something that we're doing straight up. Um, and actually making sure that links and things don't just say read more, click me. Um, the key thing that we really need to be doing is communicating state and state changes. So when we're doing some interesting things there uh, is when we need to really be relying on the area. Check your, check your DOM output always. And these days you can check your accessibility API tree output as well in all browsers. And finally, I think I'd say to ARIA or not to ARIA. Um, ARIA is aimed at screen readers, and that's awesome. Like, that is really great because we need to cater for screen readers, but we also need to be catering for other assistive technologies. Um, so where we can, try and use native elements. Um, when we're working with other people, um, if a JavaScript framework developer doesn't know, show them um, or explain to them a little bit maybe about, hey, if we just use table <laughs> instead of div and span, then we don't have to then spend the next four weeks putting our ARIA tags, um, et cetera, on there. Please do remember that each, so where we spoke about the DOM, so like anything in web, we have a standard, but it is changed in every single browser. So the DOM behaves differently in every single browser, um, and it does, each browser extends it in different ways as well. So if you are testing something um, in 
IE, you are testing it in IE on Windows. If you're testing it in Mac on Firefox and you're testing it in Mac on Firefox, there is no way to guarantee that it will come across. Um, I probably don't need to tell most of the room that screen reader testing is like cross-browser testing times about 100. <laughs> You're never going to be able to cover it all. Um, so, yeah, so, and as I said, by using those native elements, what we're really trying to avoid with that is we're trying to avoid the different changes that happen in the DOM across the browsers, and we're trying to make that experience a little bit more um, similar across all the browsers. And pretty much I think that's all I have to say. Go forth and make the web more accessible. And thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, Amy Marie. Now, I think we've got time for a couple of quick questions, if uh, anyone's got a question. And I've only got one handheld mic, so it's going to be someone running around. But. Uh, hi. Um, so you mentioned you can uh, check the accessibility API, uh, the, the accessibility tree output uh, for a page. Is that something that can be used for um, automated testing just to help round off some of the other automated testing you could do? Um, yes. So when you're, it depends on what you're using with your CI/CD process and if you're building that, that um, yourself. Um, the, now, I'm not 100% up there on all testing tools. There's 10 on that does an automated testing. Um, I'm not sure if they're, they're testing, checking the accessibility tree. I might have somebody that has some info to add to that. No? Oh, OK. I was, thought, <laughs> I was getting excited. Then maybe someone else knows. Um, yeah, you'd have to look. You'd have to actually look into the browser kit. I know that you can get access to it in Firefox. I can't tell you what you can and can't do in IE or Chrome. Yeah, you can be checking for those properties though. So one thing you can do in an automated test is to check for your ARIA tags or ex et cetera, or to test that ele native elements are actually there. Yeah. If I find anything out more, I put it under the hashtag. Hi. Uh, sorry, I looked like I had information. It's I actually okay. just had a sorry. question. Um, <laughs> I will, would be interested to know your opinion. Do you think other assistive technologies should be paying attention to ARIA in the API? Would, um, it, would it have a benefit? Oh, sorry. Um, I had. I'm just repeating the yeah. question for the volume. Um, in your opinion, do you think other assistive technologies should be paying attention to ARIA and the accessibility API? It's a, that's a really, really tough question um, because these technologies are not cheap. So if we, yeah, so I mean, screen readers themselves are a little bit different. Um, one, because they're software, two, they sit on your, your device as opposed to assistive tech that um, isn't on a computer. Uh, it's a hardware-driven device as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I really wouldn't like to say anything. I couldn't really say anything more to that. Um, mm, just that it, things are costly. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, we've got no more time for any more questions because we've got a, we've yeah. sort of moved into the changeover, but Amy Marie will be around for anyone who wants to ask. Yeah, I'll be around today questions. and tomorrow, so yep. feel free to yeah, come up and have a chat. So We've got a couple of minutes before... Um, Rick gets on stage and sort of sets himself up, but this is the changeover time, so if anyone wants to, to change over into the other screen, this is your opportunity.